Hello and, and welcome to this College of Law webinar, Develop Your Legal Career, Become an International Arbitrator. My name is Martin Pallain, I'm a teaching fellow at the college and with such an enticing title to today's event, I'm very pleased to say that we're joined by a particularly experienced, in, in fact I might even say illustrious panel. So let me, without further ado, introduce the panel. Um, first of all, Caroline Baroub. Um, Caroline is the managing partner of HJM Asia Law, which is a boutique law firm with offices in China and Singapore. Caroline was admitted to practice in both New York and Singapore and has been based in Asia since 1998. Um, she established her firm in 2007 and represents SMEs, multinationals, foreign banks and private, e private equity firms within the Asia Pacific region. Um, it's fair to say that, that Caroline works across a range of sectors. Um, she's also an arbitrator appointed by the Chinese European Arbitration Center and a foreign arbitrator appointed by CTAC, which of course is China's leading and longest established arbitral institution. Caroline also lectures at a number of universities and in 2015 was selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. So, so welcome, Caroline. Uh, Karen Goff is, is, is our next panelist, um, described by the Legal 500 as the sort of advocate that most clients dream of instructing. Uh, Karen has a renowned international practice as counsel, attorney at law, arbitrator, adjudicator, and ADR neutral. Um, she specialized for more than 30 years in complex construction, engineering, professional negligence, and general commercial disputes. In doing so, representing government, government agencies, and major commercial organizations. It's fair to say that, 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 that Karen has a particularly high profile as an arbitrator, and has appeared as both arbitrator and as a party representative in high profile commercial disputes spanning Europe, Asia, and the Caribbean. Uh, she's really the, the go-to expert for disputes arising out of projects governed by the FIDIC forms of contract and is a past president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Karen is a, is a chartered arbitrator, a certified international ADR practitioner of the Asian Institute of ADR, which is based in KL, and also an accredited TechPAR adjudicator. And so welcome, Karen. And our third panelist, Jonathan Warren. Uh, Jonathan is a partner at CMS Cameron McKenna Navarro, where he's a practice group leader and head of international disputes. Uh, Jonathan's got over 30 years experience in handling complex domestic and cross-border disputes in a range of sectors, including life sciences, financial services, and technology. And he's particularly known for acting for international clients in significant multi-party jurisdictional matters. Although based in London, Jonathan has wide experience in Asia Pacific, where he was instrumental in growing his firm Singapore office. Indeed, he's a long-standing and very active officer of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. Uh, Legal 500 des describes Jonathan as an expert litigator, great tactician, and giver of extremely valuable strategic advice. So those are our panelists. And now to the, the substance of today's event, international arbitration. Uh, many of you I know will be familiar with this field of practice, but for those of you who aren't, um, international arbitration is a private dispute resolution process uh, between parties from, from different states, and it provides a, a final and binding outcome in the form of an award, really the, the arbitral equivalent of a judgment. And for many, the prospect of a neutral tribunal applying a procedure capable of being largely shaped by the parties themselves and backed by a global enforcement mechanism really is a, a very attractive alternative to litigation before a national court, especially as arbitration can be combined with other forms of, of ADR, particularly uh, mediation. Our principal focus today is on international commercial arbitration, which is uh, a contractual arrangement based on, on, on the arbit arbitration agreement between parties, 
but I'm sure we'll also touch upon investment arbitration, uh, which is essentially or certainly predominantly treaty based. And arbitrations become a particularly popular, dare I say, fashionable practice area. So inevitably, for young lawyers, those setting out in the profession, um, it's become a very competitive area of practice. So whether you see yourself as a party representative or a future arbitrator, hopefully we'll have some tips and some sage advice for you. There's a, a Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free during the course of the session to type any questions you might have. We'll try to answer um, as many as possible of those uh, at, at the end of the panel discussion. But, but let me now turn to our panel. And uh, Caroline, in fact, let me turn first to you. What drew you to dispute resolution practice, particularly in Asia? I, I mentioned that you've been uh, established in Asia now for over 20 years. What, uh, what first drew you to that area of practice and of course to that geographical area? Yeah. Thank you, Martin, for the question. Um, first, I'm going to say I never wanted to do um, dispute resolution. Um, and sometimes life just throw you somewhere and you just have to accept it and, 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 and enjoy it. So enjoy the ride. So um, I start like uh, just in terms of background, I'm Canadian. I really wanted to go to Asia. So like I just thought like, you know, in the mid 90s, it was the place to be. Um, I thought like it would be a good niche to have. Um, so I decided I would go to study Chinese law in Singapore. So I wanted, I had to save some money to be able to get there. And there was only a few firms giving internship to second year students. So I ended up working in a litigation firm in Montreal, um, which had like litigation arbitration practice. That's all they had, they didn't have a corporate practice which is what I wanted to do initially. So when I started law school, I was like, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer, m and um, lawyer. And, um, but my first experience like for a few years was uh, working in a litigation arbitration practice. So this was my first like experience um, in that field. Then I moved to, um, so saving money, I ended up in Singapore studying Chinese law, again, making sure that I would do corporate law. So I joined a French law firm at late 90s and it was a corporate law firm. So I was really happy. I had left the dispute uh, practice. I was going to do like corporate work, due diligence, acquisition, all good. Um, and then in 2001, uh, 2000, I joined a British firm and then there was an internet bubble. And I know like um, maybe some attendees are younger, so they may not remember that bubble. Um, I joined an, a British firm and um, of course the practice, the corporate practice became very slow. You know, there was no corporate deals um, during the crash. Um, and then like, you know, like my billable hours were getting really low because there was no work to do. And then um, I was always the type of young lawyer, like, you know, like, can I help anyone? Can I, I would go see each partner. And one uh, arbitration partner said, well, we really need someone. Can you join? I'm like, well, of course I'll join. So I started to work with this team for about six months. Um, it was a big ICC arbitration case. Um, and then um, one Monday morning, they said, well, we need someone to go to Bangkok to collect evidence to deal with the witness, et cetera. Like, is there anyone who can go? Again, raise my hand. I was the youngest lawyer. I said, yeah, I'll go. I was supposed to go there for a week, ended up going there like for six, eight months. Um, so, and I carry on working on the case after it was a big ICC arbitration. In fact, we had a few ICC arbitration case in the construction field. Um, so I had left corporate practice again <laughs> for the second time. Yeah. So that's how I ended up doing, um, dispute resolution. Um, I eventually went back to corporate because that's really what I wanted to do, but I was like, you know, having background in two, two type of, uh, in a uh, field has been really useful. Um, because I feel like, you know, you can, you, I learned from my dispute resolution experience, like, you know, um, and then like I, I use that, that knowledge to become a better corporate lawyer. No, that, that, so that's, that's how I ended up having a mixed experience. Car Caroline, thank, thank, thank you so much. And I think that the lesson perhaps then is seize the opportunity when it presents itself, um, be adaptable yeah. and, and be in the right place at the right time. So Caroline, thank you. Thanks so much. Car Karen, let, let me turn to you. You, of course, very successfully combine 
uh, practice as a party representative, an arbitration lawyer, with sitting as an arbitrator. What drew you to the, those two roles and that combination? Also, I, I mentioned your, 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 your heavy engagement in the Caribbean. What, 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 what drew you there? Well, if I take the last part first, because there I identify completely with Caroline, and that is, you just follow the work. And my work took me to the Caribbean. I mean, I started practice uh, easily a decade before Caroline, I think. And uh, I was a young woman going to the bar in London. And frankly, um, you know, gender, women were very unwelcome, particularly in the commercial and construction area at the time. And I didn't want to do family and I didn't want to do crime. I didn't want to do transactional work, which was important. Yeah. Same as Car well, Caroline wanted to do it. I didn't want to do it. So notwithstanding the difficulties, I chose the bar. I chose disputes. And to get into commercial work was really difficult for women, as I've just said. So I thought, well, I know about construction. Um, I won't explain why, because we haven't got all day, but I know about construction. So I really blagged my way into a construction pupillage in London with one of the best construction sets. And the minute you start doing construction disputes, the default dispute resolution in 1980s London under the standard forms of contract was arbitration. And I knew about arbitration because I'd actually picked international trade and international commercial arbitration as options in university. So I just went that way and everything after that was really just organic. One thing followed another. I did domestic disputes, domestic arbitration. The more senior I got, bigger disputes, international disputes, international arbitration. And, um, you know, and then I had a family and then I thought, well, you still have to network. So I joined the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and, and developed it that way. But um, there wasn't on my part, um, a really conscious uh, choice to be an arbitrator or to do arbitration, but it, it's absolutely at the core of construction dispute resolution. So it was obvious that I would have to go that way. Um, and it wasn't a hardship. And, and do you now consciously uh, try to balance your time as an arbitrator with time as a as representative, as, a, as counsel? Yes, it, I mean, I do more and more arbitration and adjudication, and it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, so, yes, I mean, it's, it, it is quite hard to balance. It's not, I think, as hard to balance work as counsel and arbitrator as it is, for example, to balance work as expert and arbitrator. Obviously, I work with a lot of experts, non-legal experts, technical experts, yeah. and they uh, really have to make a conscious choice between practice uh, and sitting as an expert or, or appearing as an expert. I think it's easier at the bar. You can manage your diary yourself. You know, you're, um, and, and it'd be interesting to hear what Jonathan says about this yes. because he works in a big partnership and it may be more difficult for him, but I'm really mistress of my own diary, which is why I chose <laughs> the bar in the first place. No, no, Karen, that's very helpful. And, and that's a great link into Jonathan. So jo Jonathan, you're, you're, of course, in a, in a, in a very large um, law firm. Um, what's drawn you to your area of practice? Were, were you attracted by specific sectors, for instance? Um, were you attracted more by litigation than arbitration or, 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 uh, or attracted equally by both? And also, to what extent within a large law firm, with perhaps a corporate culture, are you able as a young lawyer to shape your own destiny? Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Martin. And, and, and obviously listening to Caroline and Karen's stories, my, mine, um, I think, is, is um, a little bit more opportunistic. I mean, I, I came into the profession in the sort of mid 80s, and I have to say I was very, very naive about what that meant and, and what the opportunities were. So I sort of kind of stumbled into um, the car, kind of whole process, really. So um, if you can kind of, uh, some of you might think back to the mid 80s, uh, London, it was a very different environment and Karen's given a bit of a setting on that front as well and I, I suppose um, I had no background, my family weren't from a legal background uh, and so on so I actually was sort of feeling my way and, and so I became an article clerk which was the sort of terminology that was used at the time before we used the concept trainee solicitor 
and I just sort of threw myself into what it was and, and, and I became involved in a lot of kind of um, varied disputes and sort of I kind of got the bug but at that stage it wasn't I'm going to be involved in international disputes I'm going to be involved in litigation or arbitration it was just training and developing and exposing or being exposed to those opportunities and and so what what Karen said um, it really resonated with me in terms of you know just um, being open to these things and I think um, your career or certainly my career has evolved organically and, and um, I suppose the, the one feature when I started to get into my stride a little bit is that I recognized that I really liked connecting with the people and uh, became you know learn was you know is obviously an international center and even back in the sort of 80s it was starting to become much more international and I just noticed that that was an opportunity so I kind of got involved and that international connectivity uh, then led me on a bit of a journey and, and very much like Caroline and, and Karen. Um, I mean, in terms of your, your second part of your question, in terms of operating in a large law firm, I mean, I think, um, you know, all lines of um, the profession provide opportunities, but if you're in a large law firm, then clearly you have an ability to kind of get exposed to different areas of work, um, different jurisdictions, um, dif different perspectives. So I think, you know, you can, and, and I would encourage people just really to seize those opportunities be curious, explore them, and keep a very open mind. And um, my experience has, has, has shown me that actually um, opportunities come times, sometimes come from very, very surprising places. You know, Jonathan, thank you. Um, while we're, we're on that, that tack, um, what are the, the attributes or skills that you regard as being prerequisites for an arbitration lawyer and potentially an arbitrator? Um, are they are they different from those required of a litigator, or is it is it dispute resolution as a whole in terms of skill set? How I mean, you you see young lawyers coming through, you no doubt mentor them, you work with them. What attributes and skills would you identify as being the key? Well, I think um, you know th there's a big debate on this. I mean, there are a wide range of um, attributes and skills that one needs to build to, I think, succeed in the law. Um, but, you know, there are the hard edge technical aspects. And I think that those will be very much at the forefront of, of most people's minds when you start out in your career, because that's you're learning your trade and you're kind of really, really building your experience. But I think there's a whole host of other attributes that come along with it. And they're kind of loosely described as the sort of soft skills, although I think that's probably a bit of a misnomer, because I think um, certainly from my experience, um, having those skills um for example communication uh you know the ability to read a situation to build relationships uh, to connect these things i think are probably uh, really core to actually what we do certainly in the, the solicitor side and i expect um uh, caroline and, and, and karen would agree that these are it's not just the technical skills you need you need the breadth of others I and mean, in terms of you know the difference between litigation and arbitration i mean these are dispute resolution processes and so i think that there are undoubtedly different techniques and different issues in, in, in the different disciplines but i think the core skill sets are very very similar um so i i, I certainly see a breadth of issues and, and um you know when one one is looking at these things i think it's just um a question of kind of keeping a very broad uh, perspective on the different skills that you need to build um, certainly from, from, from my experience anyway. Yeah. And, and, and Jonathan, when you're um, working with, with young lawyers, when you're perhaps even recruiting young lawyers, do you, do you look for uh, commercial awareness, commercial savviness, if you like, as well as legal prowess? We do. We do, very much so. I mean, because, you know, we, we obviously serve our clients and our clients are commercial uh, entities or, or individuals. And so they expect... Uh, the legal advice we give to be in the context of a commercial um, world and so becoming uh, uh, or being educated and aware of the kind of commercial dynamics and broader um, international themes and, and so on is absolutely critical to being effective in the role so most definitely yes and and, and the other thing that we look for um, is really for people to um, be basically future future facing and, and that's something that at cms we we Think is really really important so kind of spotting trends or being open to change and we will all know from what we've seen in the last 12 months that one has to be very resilient and open to change and that that, that is um, very much a part of our kind of ethos and our outlook on things um, yeah. so absolutely 
no, that, that, that's helpful. Car Caroline, can, can, can I ask you this? O on this issue of um, necessary attributes and skills, in Asia Pacific, and obviously particularly in, in, in China where, where, where you work, are there particular attributes, particular skills that are required for the dispute resolution lawyer? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for the question. Um, just to go back on what Jonathan said, I totally agree with what he said about um, soft skill and technical skills. I would say like, you know, for example, in, in China and in Asia in general, a lot of people have the technical skills. You know, like everybody is really good. I always said to my also young lawyer, everybody does eight to six, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. work. You know, like this is the norm. So I think what will make the difference with a young lawyer or a successful uh, person in our profession is like, you know, like the, the extra time, you know, like the, the time before eight and the time after six, but also the soft skills and the EQ, you know, like, um, because when you're going to interview witness, when you're going to deal with your clients, um, you know, like if you just show up and speak to your clients in legal terms, you will lose them. You know, like a lot of our clients are like, you know, um, CEO of companies, like, you know, they, they are really smart people, but they really get bored with the technicalities. They want you to be able to like, you know, like get to the point from a commercial perspective. So you really have to make sure that you're like, you can, simplify the legal process and the inform information you're going to give them um, otherwise like you know like it's they, they lose interest and they're not really happy from my experience maybe like um, other clients are different but my clients they really want to they, they want to get a straight answer simple answer um, so like EQ soft skills are crucial um, being curious trying to uh, adapt to the different type of clients you have the different type of witnesses you have um, is really important. And of course, if you talk, you're talking about the China thing, you know, like it's China is, is, is a big market. It's a very exciting market interviewing witness there. Um, you do have to act a bit differently. Like, you know, like a lot of time the English, uh, the English will not be um, as great. So you really have to make sure that, you know, you can navigate and try to either speak Chinese, which is of course ideal. Um, but, you know, like also like simplify English to make sure like you get the answer you need for, for, for preparing for your case. Um, so the cultural aspects is key in terms of language, but also how you're going to deal with them. Like, you know, everybody has heard about the loose face concept in China. You know, the way you ask questions, like, you know, cannot be too, con you cannot confront them in a too aggressive way. You really have to do it in a, in, in a, in a different ways, I would say, than what you do in the West. Um, so you, you, you do have to get these soft skills very quickly. You know, like you don't have like a 10 year time frame to get them. Like as soon as a client, like, you know, like would throw you um, there, like you just have to go on the fast track learning process and be able to adapt and, and be able to know what will be accepted in, in the Chinese culture and what will not be accepted in the Chinese culture. Because otherwise, you know, like you won't be able to deliver the result you promised your client. When you came into the region, particularly that issue of, of um, not being seen to lose face. Did, did you find it difficult to adapt your uh, interpersonal skills, your relationship with clients to, to reflect that and to sort of manage their expectations in that way? It's a very interesting question. I, it's funny, I had this, I discussed this topic this week with, with someone from the US and the reason I, I've been in Asia for so long and the reason um, I stay here, it's because I really feel like I like the concept of not losing face so I could relate very easily to it I could also relate to the fact that you like in, in China people work really hard all the time so like you can you can ask your witness like can I meet on a Saturday night at seven and they're just gonna say yes so for me like you know like I've I've been used in the west sometimes if you ask people like oh can we work on Saturday all day and on Sunday people will look at you like oh who is this crazy person but in Asia like it's the norm like you know they just work all the time so the, this concept and the concept, working hard and different odd time and all the time, and the concept of losing face was just very, I was, I felt I was finally in the right place. I was no longer the oddball. Um, so I didn't have much difficulty to adapt to this part. Um, but you know, like if you're going to move to China, you have to be ready to that type of mentality. You know, like if you can easily call a witness at 8 p.m. on a Saturday night, you won't say, well, I'm having a social dinner, I cannot take the call. Is going to tell you that, yeah, yeah, let's meet like in half an hour and we can have a face-to-face -face discussion. 
which you know, like really suit my mindset. Um, so it was not difficult, but you have to be ready to grab the opportunity. Like if, if a witness in China wants to meet you now, like, you know, no matter what is the time, you should just say yes. Um, so it was, it was easy, but yeah, as long as, as people were having, going to these countries and are ready to adapt, I think there, there shouldn't be any issues. Thank, thanks, Caroline. Uh, Karen, can I ask you this? We're, we're talking about attributes and skills. What about for an arbitrator, particularly the, 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 the young lawyer in, in, intent on becoming an arbitrator? What particular skills or attributes do you look for? And are they, are they the same as you'd look for in a judge, sort of judicial skills, or, or is there something more? I'd say ethically, you're looking for the same level of integrity and commitment to work as you would as a, if you were looking for a litigator. Um, I think the key to becoming an arbitrator, which is what I think people want to know, is you pick an area of law for practice in which arbitration and dispute resolution are the default or at least very popular mechanisms for resolving those commercial disputes. Uh, I mean, clearly, if you pick a, an area of law where there isn't that opportunity, it's going to be very difficult unless you fall in, as Caroline did, unless you fall into it. So uh, I think that's key is actually pick your, your area of substantive law and practice first. Uh, and also the other thing you need to do is put yourself in harm's way, as Caroline seemed keen to do, as I always did. You, you know, you need to pick a firm if you're going to work in a firm, and most young lawyers have to work in a firm. Um, there are very few places in the world where you can just leap into independent practice. I would say the Caribbean is one, but um, you, you should work in a good firm. So you pick a good set of chambers, you pick a good firm, and you pick um, an area of law to work in where arbitration is popular, if not the default mechanism for resolving disputes. Just picking up what Caroline said about people on a Saturday night being willing in, in China to meet face to face. I mean, that prompts me to say something about cultural sensitivity. Working in the Caribbean, my first experience of working in the Caribbean was having to ply an expert with copious amounts of whiskey after 4.30 any day of the week simply to keep him in the room and working. Otherwise he was gone. And you couldn't get him in early the next morning because the traffic into Port of Spain was a nightmare. And, and so, you know, cultural awareness, awareness of the practical logistical difficulties that people have when you're working with them, and also aware of their cultural, their culture. Um, you know, the Caribbean people are not going to work late, late in the day. Some of them will work early in the morning, um, but a lot of them won't do that either. So you really have to um, work with what you've got and um, be sensitive to the culture of the people around you. And depending where you are in the world, uh, uh, as you can see from my experience and Caroline's differing experiences, it's radically different. But for a young lawyer, what do they need to do? As I say, pick a good firm, get cracking in, in dispute work in the areas of law, and then I think today, and I don't know what Jonathan will think about this because he's looking from uh, a perhaps different aspect, but I would say join um, an arbitral institution, join uh, an organization like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and get some qualifications. Because the, young, young, the one thing we see with lawyers, um, pupils coming through chambers is they've got so many qualifications. They've all got fantastic degrees. They've all got um, uh, certainly masters or PhDs in something. So you're, you're constantly on the look for something else. So if they've got arbitral training, disputes training, if they're certified mediators, you can do all these things at a young age. And I think it's really helpful. I became a fellow of the Chartered Institute. I did a diploma in international commercial arbitration, although I was already doing international disputes work. Um, I became a chartered arbitrator. Ultimately, um, you know, I ran the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators for a few years, but that's sort of a bit, bit beyond the pale, really. You don't need to do that. But getting some arbitral com um, qualifications is really, really helpful. Karen, can I, can I ask this? As sometimes young lawyers will say they still feel that it's a bit of a closed shop, that becoming an arbitrator, even with the qualifications, 
becomes so dif difficult. Um, one hears of mentoring schemes that some of the institutions have set in place, shadowing this, this, the, 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 these sorts of initiatives. But is it, is it a closed shop? And I think also, perhaps going back to what you were saying um, with your experiences in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the 1980s, in relation to gender issues, is, is, is it male dominated or, or, or is it a, a level playing field for, for men and women? What, what, what would you advise a, a young lawyer on, on all of that? I would say this, if you want to do it, do it. And, you know, I mean, it's like when you become, I, I became a young barrister doing commercial work in the 1980s. They really didn't want women, but I just got on with it. And I think the good thing about when you're a young professional, you know, you, you, you're up for it and you're up for the challenge. And I think, you, you know, if you're um, a young woman in arbitration, um, you know, what, whatever the diversity issue is, just grab it and run with it. Because if you're determined, you can succeed. I don't think that arbitration is a level playing field, not for women, not for people of color. But in certain areas of the world, those advantages will play with you and in others they'll play against. And you just have to go with it. Is it a closed shop? Uh, we've got lots and lots of very, very grand people in arbitration and they're grand. They are very, very good arbitrators. And, and a lot of people will say, well, they're the go to people and they've always been the go to people. You know, I can think of a dozen people where if I had a massive dispute, I'm sure Jonathan will tell you the same. You would think, oh, you know what, I'll go to them. And most of them are men. Um, but, but the picture changes and it is changing more and more. So I wouldn't let any of those issues put me off. If it's what I wanted to do, I would just go for it. Okay, Karen, th thanks, thanks very much for that. John, Jonathan, let, let, let me turn to you. Um, we, we, we were talking about the, the chances of uh, a, a young lawyer uh, uh, moving on the road to becoming an arbitrator um, and this issue of a, a, a closed shop or, or, or otherwise. Do large law firms in particular, when they're advising clients, uh, sometimes veer perhaps too conservatively on their choice of arbitrators, on advising on which arbitrator to select? Do you think there's almost a perpetuation, particularly by, by large law firms, um, of arbitration work for a relatively small group or did one say cabal of, of arbitrators? Do you think you could be more, as, 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 a, as part of the profession uh, in, a, in a large law firm, could you be perhaps more radical in your thinking in that regard? Yeah, I mean, um, what, what Karen has outlined, I think is that absolutely right. I mean, you know, um, be before I answer the question, I, I was going to observe, um, looking at the skills, we talked about technical skills, we talked about soft skills, but I think that something that underpins all of this is, is actually just be yourself. And um, Karen talked about the point that, um, you know, everyone's got lots of qualifications. It's very, very competitive. But I think that, um, you know, and this is certainly the way we look at it, is that we want people to be their authentic selves. We, want, we don't want people to feel they've got to subscribe to any particular stereotype. And so actually, um, people should feel comfortable in that approach. And that then leads on to, I think, this kind of change that's happening and this process that's happening, which is that, um, things things are changing and situations being challenged and, and Karen talked very much about the kind of arbitration environment I think that there are lots of um, people now who actually uh, are looking for um, a different way to uh, engage and but Karen's equally right that there are still um, a lot of very talented people um, in arbitration and they've been in there for a long period of time but you you are seeing change in in all ways on that front so certainly we are very open-minded uh, as a firm our clients are open-minded and, and that's the sort of place that we want to foster and encourage but there's still there's still work to do i think it's it's fair to say martin i mean they you know um it, you know i don't know how uh, karen's a lot more steeped in it than i am i don't sit as an arbitrator i i, I tend to act as counsel uh, as opposed to a, a, in an arbitrator practice so i'll defer to karen on that front Jonathan, can I, can I ask this, uh, on, on that point of choice of arbitrator, obviously one of the, the, the discussions one often hears is around the, the privacy and, to a large extent, confidentiality 
of, of the arbitral process. And therefore, really the difficulty for some parties in knowing the good, bad or indifferent arbitrator. Uh, do, do you find it difficult sometimes to be able to advise clients in that regard? Do you perhaps wish there was, there was more information out there, that more of the process was, if you like, in the public domain, in, in the sense that one could better get a better feel uh, as to the qualities of a particular individual as an arbitrator? Well, I think there is a lot more information about um, arbitrators now, and there's a lot more kind of feedback. There's a lot more of a, a feedback loop on, on, on you know, what people think about it. The directories are very active, and obviously, um, subject to the confines of confidentiality, you do hear a lot more. Um, so I think there's a balance, Martin. I mean, arbitration is a confidential process, and that's what attracts clients to, to build into their contracts. Uh, that's one of the features. So there is a bit of a challenge there, I think, in getting... Uh, too much under the hood on, on those sort of issues. Mm. Jonathan, thank you. C Caroline, can I, can I turn to you? Uh, we're, we're looking then at uh, the, the road to becoming an arbitrator for, for, for a, a, young, a young lawyer, or indeed other professional. Um, in Asia Pacific, is there uh, encouragement for um, the young arbitrator? Is, is there is there effective mentoring, for instance? I know that certain institutions, uh, HKIAC, uh, obviously the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, have outreach programmes. What do you see from within the region, particularly um, whether there are gender challenges for women, for instance, in seeking to become an arbitrator in, 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 in Asia Pacific? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'm more involved with the SIAC and CTAC in terms of arbitration commission. Um, yes. And I would say, like, you know, to get to that point, you do have, as a young lawyer, like, to start to develop a niche at a young age. Um, and, and, for example, in my case, what I've done, like, you know, so I study Chinese law. I focus on um, mid-sized companies, private equity firms as clients. Um, so when I became an arbitrator with these uh, institution, like um, they wanted arbitrator with that type of expertise. Um, so they knew that there was a need, there was a lot of dispute um, in, uh, with, with these type of companies. So they thought like, you know, if, if Caroline is an arbitrator, like, you know, like she has experience dealing with them. So I guess to go back to your question, like, you know, uh, for young, um, for younger lawyer who wants to become arbitrators, like, you know, very quickly develop a niche and make sure that it's something specific that you're passionate about, um, it's unique, um, and then build your profile around that. Um, so I would say this is probably my advice. And in terms of um, diversity, um, I know it sounds very odd answer, but I've, I, I don't know about how many women are arbitrators at CTAC or SIAC. Um, I just, I just jump in and I, you know, for me, like, again, depending on how you were, how I was brought up, like my parents never made a difference for me. I have a brother, so he's also in China, but you know, like we were always brought up like male, female, as long as you deliver what you were supposed to deliver, we don't really care. So my mindset has always been like, you know, like you have a goal, just jump into it, get, get it done. And women or men around, like, you know, like I, I never paid attention to it. Um, and as arbitrator in private practice is different. I think it's more obvious at a certain level. There's always less women, but as arbitrator, like I just feel like, you know, like I, I didn't pay attention, but it's a good question. I'm happy to check with CTAC and SIAC how many women are arbitrator and get back to you. So thank, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks so much. Um, let me ask this. We're of course in the midst still of the, 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 the global pandemic. What are the the current trends, the, the hot topics, if you like, in international arbitration. Karen, let, let me perhaps turn to you for this um, in, initially. Um, what are the, the real issues that are, that are pressing at the moment as far as international arbitration is concerned? One of the pressing issues in international arbitration, which I don't think is pandemic re um, related, I think it's just the moment for it, is actual um, gender diversity in arbitration and actually giving young practitioners the road in. So this is a really timely conversation in that regard. But pandemic issues, the first issue that, that really assaulted everybody on the planet, and I don't think it was just confined to arbitration, was how to communicate. And with arbitration, of course, arbitration like litigation, certainly in the common law world, 
uh, predominantly people want to have an oral hearing. And suddenly nobody could have an oral hearing. And an awful lot of arbitration in very many countries ground to a halt. Lots of arbitration hearings got cancelled. I remember participating participating in some seminars early on in the pandemic when people were saying, right, everything in person has been cancelled. So we're now looking at how to progress these disputes without actually meeting anybody anywhere in the world. And of course, suddenly Zoom became a word, Microsoft Teams became a word, WebEx became a word. All of these platforms suddenly became very, very interesting indeed. And everybody had to learn how to work remotely. And then once we could connect, we had then had to learn how to adjust all the processes in arbitration. So how do you cross-examine an expert or a witness and make sure that the integrity of their evidence um, was as pure as it could be, as if you were looking at them in the uh, witness box and you knew they weren't looking at their phone and you knew that there was nobody sat to the side telling them what to say. All of those kind of questions had to be managed really, really rapidly. And, and I think amazingly, things that would perhaps have taken 10 years to come to fruition in the ordinary progress of a profession, suddenly overnight, it became the norm. Uh, and similarly for court litigation, I had an arbitration related dispute in the Court of Appeal in Trinidad. And I would never have dreamed in my life that a year ago now, over a year ago, I would be on Microsoft Teams talking to the Court of Appeal judges in Trinidad and presenting a case from this room with my papers around me. I mean, it just, and very much with arbitration, it was either do, not, do nothing or get this sorted quickly. And people got it sorted really, really quickly, right down to, you know, where do you put your computer? Do you have it on the stand? Do you have it on the floor? Do you have another screen? Um, do you have a microphone? All of those practical issues, people just grabbed and dealt with, and the arbitral institutions dealt with them very quickly. The next thing then was, well, if somebody insists on an oral hearing, and a lot of people don't always want their dispute to progress, if somebody insists on an oral hearing, how do you manage that? So the next thing was all of the arbitral institutions had to review their rules and make sure that whatever rules they had, it was actually possible have an arbitra arbitration hearing because if you do something which is not within the party's agreement you then risk challenging the recognition and enforceability of any arbitration award so people had to grapple with those issues but then in the broader context there are some really interesting things um, kept coming through with arbitration certainly emergency applications it used to be if you had an emergency application to preserve property and you were in an arbitration you had to run to the local court and get an order. Uh, now, most of the arbitral institutions have amended their rules. You can get emergency arbitrators appointed. You can apply for orders to preserve property, all kinds of things like that. Now in arbitration, just briefly, you can get summary disposal of arbitration cases. That was unheard of a decade ago. Now, at least Stockholm, Singapore is very good with this. A number of institutions are bringing in the rule changes so that you can have summary dismissal of cases where really there isn't going to be a defense. And that changes whether you have one arbitrator or a panel of three arbitrators. You know, so there are quite a few things coming on to introduce into arbitrations some of the advantages of the more developed litigation systems. Um, trending, of course, is dispute avoidance because there's been a pandemic and people want to get on and resolve their disputes if they've got money owed to them. They want to get it, so they're looking for other ways of getting it. And therefore, we're seeing international arbitration still as re really um, the most important means of binding dispute resolution, but more and more seeing it as part of a multi-tiered um, scheme of dispute resolution. So that's a thumbnail sketch of where we are, I think. No, that, 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 that's helpful. Can I just ask one thing by way of, way of comeback? The, the necessity to have virtual hearings, online hearings, etc. Has that, has that changed international arbitration forever? I mean, will the, the cost savings, the convenience, etc. mean that we, we have fewer um, 
hearings in person going forward, even after the, uh, the, the pandemic. Yes, I, th I thought about that. I thought, well, is this a forever solution? And in some cases, yes, for small and medium sized disputes, very definitely. But when you have a huge dispute uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's hard to quantify in numbers the size of some of these disputes in international arbitration. I think we're still going to have the hearings because of all those difficulties. I mean, for example, if you want to arbitrate in the Middle East, I've arbitrated in the Middle East, you have to have all the people in the jurisdiction in the room. Uh, and unless they change their laws, that's going to continue to be the case. And of course, some of the biggest disputes are held in the Middle East. They rise out of projects in the Middle East. And so that will still be the norm. But what we won't see, I think, uh, is, for example, I'm doing a massive dispute that's based in London, but the lawyers are in the Middle East, the parties are in Jordan, in Iraq, in India. We're not going to see all of those people hauled into London for a day long directions hearing. And, you know, that was one of the complaints before. I don't think we'll ever go back to that now. You know, we will do all those kind of things, all the short stuff will be done virtually, if it can be. The Karakhan, thank, thank you. Um, Jonathan, from the perspective of the, the party representative, the, the, the lawyer advising and representing a commercial party, what do you see as the, the current trends, particularly the perhaps current areas of concern for clients in the, the dispute resolution arena? Yeah, well, I think I think I mean I just echo what Karen has said in terms of uh, direction of travel and experience over the last sort of 12, 18 months, um, and it really identifies the issue of uh, the commercial significance of uh, lawyers uh, assisting clients on dispute resolution, whether that be litigation, arbitration, or, or mediation. And I think that um, what I have um, seen, and it's always been a, a, a focus, is that clients are very sensitive about costs. And Karen has identified the issue with virtual hearings and um, going forward probably less in-person hearings for sort of the interlocutory matters or the smaller matters. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that um, clients will you know, rightly seize upon that as being an opportunity to, to, to cut costs and, and maintain cost efficiency. So I think that issue of cost is a key, key component. I also think that um, as part of the other theme that that's coming through, that there's an increase in third party funders um, getting involved in um, litigation uh, and arbitration and obviously there's a regulatory regime in many jurisdictions um, that, that, that impacts that um, but that's another theme that we're seeing increasingly and again it comes back to clients looking for commercial solutions um, so and, and Martin just remind me of the, the, the other, other aspect of your question. Uh, if, if there's particular um, issues currently that, that perhaps clients are raising over and above costs, um, uh, obviously for third for party funding issue you mentioned, but I wonder whether there, there's anything else that, that clients are particularly looking to in, in, in dispute resolution at the moment. I think, um, you know, the, the pandemic has kind of undoubtedly focused on kind of resolution and getting things resolved quickly. Yes. Um, and I, I think there's a, a more pragmatic response by the whole community. Um, I, I think actually it's not, not, not um, we're also seeing our clients actually picking up on this issue around sustainability, which feeds into how uh, the practice of law operates. And um, it does again touch upon uh, costs and costs relating to travel, for example. And I think when yes. we return, I mean, people have not traveled so much, but people are globally acutely aware of the importance of um, sustainability issues in the environment and I think that that's becoming an increasing feature in the dialogue that one has with clients and I think it will shape how we operate as uh, dispute resolution practitioners over the coming years. Yes, no, that, 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 that's interesting. Thank, thanks Jonathan. Um, Caroline, can I ask you this? We're, we're talking about current trends. Obviously, given, given your position in China, I can't but help ask uh, around China's Belt and Road Initiative, the current the current effect that, that that initiative is having on dispute resolution and, and perhaps also in that um, the relationship between arbitration and 
the use of specialist commercial courts. We've seen China set up Belt and Road courts, for instance. What's the what, what's, what's your perspective on all of that? Um, that's a very good question. I guess the challenge you have to keep in mind is like, you know, you can have an arbitration award from a special, you can have a, a, an award from a special court or from arbitration commission. The enforceability of the award is important. Um, China has signed, for example, the New York Convention. So like they recognize foreign arbitration award if it's not like under, um, but the enforceability is always a challenge in China, you know? So that's why you really have to be wise about choosing which, how you're gonna resolve your dispute with the Chinese counterpart. Um, the BRI, you know, like not all disputes involve a Chinese counterpart. Sometimes it's like, you know, two foreign companies having, having a project around the one belt, one, uh, the BRI um, initiative, and there's nothing to do with China. But if there's a Chinese counterpart involved, uh, I usually uh, recommend to have CTAC um, to be the arbitration commission because I feel it just make it easier for the enforceability of the word after. Um, but I would say this is the trend that I see and, and that we have, um, we have observed in the last like, um, two years. Yes. How, how do you feel about the, the, the specialist commercial courts? Uh, I personally didn't have an experience with them. I know like a few clients who had to deal with them. Um, they were quite happy. They thought like, you know, like the, the, the judge, like, you know, were really um, had a good experience, had a relevant experience. Um, it, it was great, uh, but I didn't have a personal experience with the special court, but I think it's, it's a good way to go. Yes, thank, thank you. Karen, Karen can, can I ask this? We're, we're, we're mentioning the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, is, is that something that is, as far as you're concerned, um, of relevance outside the region? I mean, I'm conscious that you've got this, 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 this heavy Caribbean practice. Are the implications of Belt and Road actually broader than just, just Asia Pacific? Very much so. Um, you know, the implications of the Belt and Road are really quite profound and they're global, absolutely global. I mean, the numbers being bandied around as 5 trillion or 13 trillion US dollars worth of, um, you know, predominantly infrastructure projects around the world, all kinds of projects. One of the most interesting things I did just before the pandemic was I gave, um, I gave a presentation in the British Virgin Islands to the BVI International Arbitration Center at their arbitration week. And they asked me to talk about Belt and Road and I thought, why particularly? I mean, I knew, I knew from working particularly in Jamaica and in Trinidad and Tobago, that there is a huge amount of Chinese work, I say Chinese work, work being undertaken by Chinese firms, and I assume also funded by the Chinese in the Caribbean. But actually, if you look at a map of the Belt and Road, it doesn't go as far as the Caribbean. It touches on Africa, but you wouldn't assume, just looking at the map, that it's all across Africa. Um, when you think of Belt and Road, you don't obviously think about Europe so much, but actually, if you look at the map, it goes all the way across to the Channel. It doesn't reach London. But there's lots of Chinese development going on in London. But specifically, uh, uh, there's lots going on in Africa, and there's a huge amount going on in the Caribbean. And some of the Caribbean islands have actually signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. So the impact is, as I say, it's, it's global. Um, and dealing with disputes under the Belt and Road, once you get outside of the Asia Pacific um, area, I think is, is difficult. Uh, when I was trying to think about it, I obviously thought that this was going to come up and I thought, well, you know, what's What's really the issue? And, and I listen to Caroline speak and I look at the sort of the way I think about it and the way that other people with um, practices in different regions think about it. And there's a, a whole lot more, I think, unease. I wouldn't say distrust necessarily, but certainly suspicion about how on earth they will ever deal with any serious dispute, belt and road dispute. Uh, that involves the PRC. So uh, the PRC has set up these courts, but they only deal with disputes where the PRC is involved. For the rest of the world, 
you then have to think, well, how are we going to manage these disputes, um, whether they involve the PRC or not? Where are we going to make the substantive law of the contract? Where are we going to seat any arbitration, which is actually really very important in terms of any challenge to an award. Um, in terms of enforceability, there are preferred seats where you think, well, if we seat it there, you know, it would be a better place to have, have the hearing. If we have then to go somewhere else to try and enforce it, that place will have more respect. So you're looking at substantive law, you're looking at the seat, uh, you are looking at your arbitrators. This is where your grand people of arbitration are really quite helpful. So, uh, um, you know, so where are you going to have an arbitration? Hong Kong is obviously, I think there's going to be a lot more disputes in Hong Kong. Singapore is very popular. Um, I can't see London and New York and other European destinations being quite so popular in terms of where the bulk of the investment is going, certainly at the moment. So there are tons of issues coming up regarding Belt and Road. I think that the Asia Pacific has embraced it more quickly, have got onto it and um, bought in schemes. Hong Kong uh, International Arbitration Centre has a scheme that deals with the Belt and Road. So lots going on with Belt and Road, and it will ring and ring, but it would be a mistake for anybody to think that if you step outside the Asia Pacific region, you wouldn't be seeing Belt and Road. It's everywhere. As I said, I was really surprised how much of it is actually going on in the Caribbean and how many of the islands have actually signed up to the specific BRI initiative. Karen, thank you. That, 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 that's a fascinating insight uh, and it indicates things are much broader on Belt and Road than one it perhaps initially imagines. Jo Jonathan, can I ask, ask you, you, you're obviously very active in Asia Pacific. As a large law firm, there's obviously a need for, for, for getting a new business, for marketing. Is, is Belt and Road something on your radar? And, and a, a subsidiary question for you, Jonathan, as well. On this issue of specialist commercial courts generally, um, whether it's London, whether it's the International Commercial Court in Singapore, whether it's the Middle East, is, 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 is the commercial court route rather than the arbitration route something that's perhaps getting increasingly attractive for clients? Yeah, I mean, to, to, to deal with the first point, um, uh, absolutely, um, BRI is, is a, a key key part. And, and um, you know, we've got colleagues that across our international platform that are very much focused on it. As um, Karen alluded to, there's probably not much going on in London at this point in time. And, and I'm a, a practitioner based out of, of London. But absolutely across our um, platform, um, there is a, a real focus and a real interest. Um, so that's the, that's the first point. The, se the second point in terms of the um, rise of the commercial course, international commercial course, I mean, I, I share um, Caroline's view that I think this is a, a good thing and it's a good thing for clients. And again, we um, participate as a firm in all the major dispute hubs. So you won't be surprised um, our clients can have um, access to those courts and take advantage of them. So I think it's a good thing and I think it just shows the interconnectivity of um, the work that we do across the globe and our clients are doing. So um, someone I think Karen mentioned earlier on in terms of when you go into the profession you follow the work and I think that's very true um, for, 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 for your clients. You follow where your clients are active and where they're going and where, where they're active tends to mean that disputes will flow so you need to be able to provide for them. So I think that uh, it's a good thing and I think the interface with arbitration just gives greater flexibility, it gives greater opportunity. Um, so, you know, arbitration is a contraction me mechanism um, and you then have the backdrop of the courts as well. So I think um, it all joins together, but I think there is an overarch on all of this, which is that these are means of res resolution. They are um, a, a route map to help clients solve their problems. So I think that's also an important context. I mean, the, the, rarely do clients want uh, disputes to go through a process and experience the process. What they want is a commercial outcome, whether it be a, a settlement or indeed a determination because they've not been able to get a resolution. So I think that's an important context and the commercial courts are part of that facility to achieve that objective. Jonathan, thank, thanks so much for that. Um, we've actually had a number of fascinating questions coming in from, uh, from our audience today. Um, let me uh, ask the first of those questions to the, to the panelists, and please 
whoever wants to answer first, please, please step in. This, this is a fascinating one. Um, what advice would you have for a young lawyer interested in arbitration in the field of international environmental law? What's, what's the advice there if somebody wanted to go into the, uh, the field of environmental law, but within the context of um, dispute resolution? Well, I'm, I'm, Martin, I'm very happy to, to chip in on that. I mean, I, I referenced earlier on, I referenced earlier on the, the important of ESG uh, in, in terms of our clients, but also law firms, and I'm, I'm sure also barristers' chambers and, and, and the like. So I think that if someone's interested in uh, environmental law and in particular the dispute aspects of it, I think that the um, environment for doing that, if I put it in those terms, is, is right. Um, and I think that uh, that is an evolving area of law. And I think that what I would be doing would be say, you know, getting involved in the discussions, get involved in the forum. Um, and you will be, you won't be surprised that many of the international organizations that have been mentioned on uh, this call um, have an environmental aspect to them. So for example, the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, which um, Martin, you mentioned at the beginning that I'm heavily involved in indeed others are, Karen's involved in, and Caroline as well. Um, has an environmental aspect to it and a, a very active arbitration forum. So if you're a young lawyer, I'd encourage you to kind of get involved in those international networks because there are always ways of exploring those topics through that. Um, I personally, um, when I started out in my, my um, professional role, um, got involved in an organisation called IESIA, which focuses on young lawyers. Um, and it's a kind of an international organisation. Um, and it was a great sort of... Um, opportunity just to connect with people internationally so i would use those forum for a, to to explore that issue of environmental arbitration and environmental law generally thanks so some very very solid advice there let me let me turn to another question um we've all spoken today about the need for for soft skills very good question here how does a, law, a young lawyer actually go about building his or her soft skills so let me pass it over to to the panel to see who'd like to take that. Karen, what about you on that? Yeah, uh, the one thing I would say about being an arbitrator um, is that, you know, it's a really broad church. So the fact that you excel at one thing or another shouldn't preclude you from looking at international arbitration. It takes all sorts to make a world and it takes all sorts to make an international arbitration community. Um, but I think the thing that we've already spoken about and the thing to emphasize is that if you're not a good communicator, it's probably not the thing for you to do. You've got to be able to communicate with people. And the way to acquire the really nuanced soft skills is just experience. You know, uh, go about it a little bit carefully, try and appreciate the views of others, be very careful when you're in a different jurisdiction, try to um, get a handle on the culture that you're in. If you're working for a few weeks in a place, I mean, the first thing when I went to the Caribbean, I'm talk of following the work, I'd never been there for even a holiday. And I suddenly had to go and do a really big arbitration in Trinidad. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about the Caribbean. I read the newspapers when I got there every single day so that I had something to talk about to the local lawyers. I started reading Caribbean literature. I started to look a bit at Caribbean history. I mean, it's up to you how far you want to go. But to be culturally aware is a really, really important soft skill. And I got that listening to Caroline as well when she said she went to Asia and then she's working in China and dealing with Chinese people. The one thing I've always tried to do, and the one thing I would say you need to do, is to understand the people you're working with and for, and you'll get the best result that you can get for them as a young advocate. Um, in terms of educational skills, well, it's no different than going to university. Join the Chartered Institute or some other thing if you really want a crash course um, for lawyers who want to become fellows. There's one in the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. The networking thing is really important. Being around people that do arbitration and listening to their war stories and watching arbitration, taking part in arbitration. It's one thing to be counsel in arbitration and it's another thing 
to sit with arbitrators. A number of the institutions now allow young lawyers to be arbitration secretaries. And I was pro probably the first ICC secretary to a panel. And it was a panel of really prestigious arbitrators dealing with one of the biggest disputes in the world. And over three years, what I learned from those guys, naturally it was guys in the 1980s, one of the, you know, what I learned from them could never have been taught to me. But sitting in a room and watching counsel, watching the witnesses, watching the experts and understanding what's going on. As a young lawyer, as counsel, the lessons are absolutely invaluable. It's like sitting with a judge when you look down on people and you see them working. You suddenly appreciate that the person that sat up there actually sees everything and hears most things. And it informs you enormously. So, you know, being in the room really is what is where you'll learn the most. And I, th I think Karen makes a, a really good point. And, and then I think also just be curious about what's out there in terms of literature and, and so on. And I mentioned earlier on about being yourself. Um, there, some of you might have come across Myers Briggs and insights, which are kind of techniques to understand you know how you relate and, and what, what your what your preferences are in terms of how you interact but also read about that ted talks are great sources of kind of insights into um soft skills and so on so i, I think in addition to the sort of very practical experience that karen's talking about kind of read around the topic um and there's so much literature out there yeah and one thing like you know which in fact like you know like a bit reiterate what uh, jonathan and karen has uh, have said but you like the I like the author Malcolm Gladwell, which is like the 10,000 hour rule, you know, to become, to get EQ, to get soft skill. It's like you have to do 10,000 hours at least, you know, if, no matter what you want to develop as a skill, you have to jump in, try it, experience it, have a great mentor, surround yourself by great mentors, but do a 10,000 hour of this, you know, like it won't happen. You won't be successful in developing these skills like within like, you know, a 20 hour training like you just have to jump in and experience it for ten thousand hours and caroline if you, if you recall one of the first times we met you and i both were talking about that over a dinner uh i can't remember where it was actually but we were both exchanging the views because we had a very similar view on these sort of issues and the importance of soft skills yeah absolutely no that, that's that that's i'm sure a fascinating insight for for, for young young lawyers listening because it is sometimes difficult for people to know exactly how to develop those skills. I think that's been a, an, an inspirational exchange. So thank, thanks so much for that. Just very briefly, we've got about a minute or two left. Let me just ask each of the panelists to perhaps make one takeaway point for, for, for our, our audience, our participants, one message, um, one piece of advice that perhaps you think would, would serve them well. So let me ask Caroline first on that. Um, I would say be passionate about what you want to do and become and surround yourself with uh, people in that environment. So if it's, as, as Karen mentioned, like, you know, like, uh, and Jonathan, like, listen to TED Talk, meet people in that field and give an expo get an exposure and visibility within that community. Thanks so much. Karen, let me turn to you for, the, for the, uh, your, your parting uh, point. Yeah, I'd say if at first you don't succeed, just don't give up and get yourself in the room. Thanks, Karen. And, and Jonathan? And I would say be yourself and uh, go for it. No, that, that's great. So, so to the point and, and, and clear advice from everyone there. But let me, let me thank our panellists so much for, their, for sharing their experience, for, for sharing their knowledge with us today. Let me thank all the, uh, the participants for staying with us throughout this, uh, what I hope has been a, a fascinating session. There are some additional questions that people have raised. We'll try to answer those in, in, in written form um, after, after, after today's session. So time, I'm afraid, has beaten us. So a big thank you all round and uh, the very best of luck to those who are embarking or about to embark on a, on a career in international arbitration. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. Good luck. Bye.